Clean Air Act evolved in the back room back when committees didn't meet in public session. And it wasn't revealed in its, in its entirety until it was made public as a completed document from the subcommittee. And all of a sudden, the public saw a statute that set all kinds of precedents in the way federal law was written. And the, a number of the industrial uh, participants or, or observers were outraged. The steel industry, the oil industry, the pulp and paper industry, and the auto industry couldn't believe that we would write a statute which they described as dr dr draconian and unenforceable and, un, uh, uh, and, and, and could not be implemented. What do you think was the catalyst that prompted this kind of sea change? Because we've talked to a lot of people, and, and you've said yourself that a lot of people up until the 1960s took pollution for granted. Well, you got to separate the country from California. California had been looking at air pollution and trying to deal with the problem that I just described for some time. And they had, in fact, enacted a law that required the development of pollution controls for cars as early as 1962 or 1963. Didn't become effective until 1966. The federal government came on later when it became evident that the American public didn't want to live in a cesspool and that they wanted to deal with not just air pollution but water pollution and solid waste and they and they were looking for something that they could grasp onto and they, they could make a difference with and pollution as we called it then was the issue that was chosen we had this youth movement that was built around Earth Day that was built around trying to find something positive to offset the anger over the Vietnam War. And, this was, and it, was, it was captured by young people through these teach-ins started by Gaylord Nelson, Earth Day started by Gaylord Nelson. Muskie had been toiling, my boss, Senator Edmund Muskie, had been toiling in the fields of working on pollution, and all of a sudden he found it a national issue, and there was a national constituency. So the, you know, when we first started in this, I remember somebody saying, it may smell like rotten eggs to you, but it smells like jobs to us. And that changed. And within, within the early part of the decade, within five, six years after we started, you began to have working people saying, we don't need this air pollution. It's affecting our health and it's affecting our welfare and we need to clean it up. What impact in the 60s? Were there particular events? I'm thinking of like, the Santa Barbara spill of 1969 or the Cuyahoga River catching on fire. Did those events capture people's imagination? Well, I think the single biggest cause was Walter Cronkite on CBS News night after night doing this series on uh, pollution in America. And so you, ha you had a national media figure talking about these pollution problems. At the same time, that you had these major pollution events. Yes, the Santa Barbara oil spill, but that was preceded by a huge oil spill, the Torrey Canyon off the coast of France, the Ocean Eagle off uh, in Puerto Rico. So we had the oil spills and the oil spill legislation, which actually preceded the Clean Air Act, a very, very uh, uh, strong piece of pollution legislation. But we, we, we also had air pollution episodes. We had an air pollution episode in Washington, D.C. while we were writing the Clean Air Act. We were sitting in a conference room and looking out the window, and, and, and the smog was pervasive. And, and a senator from uh, Virginia named William Spong said, we can't not respond to this problem. So, so it, it was a sort of a coming together of a series of events, people, and public activism. What was it like, though, writing this law, knowing that you had all these events happening on the outside and the public demanding that kind of action? Well, the neat thing about working for a guy like Ed Muskie was he, all, he believed firmly that a politician who didn't take advantage of a crisis was wasting his time. So he, he told us, he said, find the steps that can be taken to deliver on a promise to clean up the air in a time frame that the American public will accept. 
And he said, don't tell me what you can't do, tell me what we can do. And it was a result of that charge, we sat down at the staff level and began to craft these various provisions which responded to their recommendations. It's pretty obvious, Nixon signed it only after uh, a, an appeal from Senator Cooper, the ranking Republican on the committee, and Senator Randolph, the chairman. And th when he did sign it, he signed it in a ceremony in the White House to which Muskie was specifically not invited. Headline the next day in the Washington Post, Nixon signs Clean Air Act, Muskie not invited. And it, w it was evident by the fact that two years later, year and a half later, he vetoed the Clean Water Act after Muskie was no longer a competitor for the Democratic nomination. What was your boss's reaction to that, that he wasn't even invited to the White House? Muskie's reaction was, uh, I'll probably get more publicity out of this not being invited than I will being invited. I don't think Nixon had a bone in his body that cared about the environment. I don't think Nixon was at all interested in Nixon, was interested in foreign policy, and basically he relegated to his other people the responsibility. John Ehrlichman, who was one of his two top aides, was very interested in the environment. So there, was, there were people in the White House who were environment directed, but not Nixon. Nixon didn't care. There was politics and there was policy. And for the most part, we were able to work with the Nixon people on the policy side. We had differences, and we had votes, and we uh, beat them. But it wasn't the kind of personal animus that seems to exist today. The Clean Air Act of 1970 was 38 pages. The Clean Air Act of 1990 was 380 pages. And in my view, that was a result of too many lawyers being involved, not too much policy being enacted. Wait a minute. The original Clean Air Act was only 38 pages long? Only 38 pages long. And it has been, and, and by the way, it's also been challenged uh, on several occasions in the Supreme Court, and it has yet to be overturned, including a unanimous decision upholding the public health standards written by Antonin Scalia. So shorter is better when it comes to public, public law. Sounds shorter, like. briefer, more precise. The, it's very hard to turn a shell into a may if you say shell and leave out the may. What to you came as the biggest moment as a young political aide that you'd achieve something significant? There are two things that are really significant to me. The earliest was when the president of General Motors, Ed Cole, came to meet with the committee again in the back room to announce that he had developed a three-way catalyst which would achieve the emission reductions that we had written into the law. I mean, it, we wrote those emission reductions into the law, the 90% reduction, based on what we knew had to be done, but we had n no idea of whether it could be done. So Cole's breakthrough in catalytic converters built on the earlier work of Engelhard Industries and, and Johnson Matthey was huge. I mean, it was very, very elevating. The second thing, somewhat later, was the Scalia decision, unanimous Supreme Court decision, upholding the health standards. Muskie wrote the Clean Air Act based on the goal of achieving air quality protective of public health. For three decades or more, industry has argued that you had to take the economic cost of achieving those standards into account. The law clearly said the standards are based on the science of health, not economics. And Scalia wrote a stingingly strong decision saying the law says no on economics and yes on health. And to me, it's sort of a capstone of my career. That decision was the thrill of, of, of the experience. I assume you've been back to California since you started there back in the 1960s. What does it feel to you when you can now actually see L.A.? Well, California is it's fascinating. I go back. I've got two clients in California, one in Northern California, one in Southern California. 
And uh, what we see in California is the, the uh, wonder of cleanup of air pollution in the coastal region and the deposit of air pollution in the inland region. So that the, the uh, San Joaquin Valley is now an extreme uh, pollution area. And Riverside, California is still an ex and, and, and all the way out to Palm Springs, still extremely dirty. So we still have a lot of work to do. And that, you know, to me, so one of the focuses ought to be how do we deal with this transport problem? It's a problem with climate change, it's a problem with acid rain, it's a problem with auto emissions. We are sending air, air pollution into the air and it's coming down someplace else. Just because we've cleaned up our neighborhood doesn't mean the job's done. But what I suggest to people who wonder what, what it would have been that they go to Mexico City or they go to Krakow, Poland, or they go to any, almost any uh, industrial city in Eastern Europe, you will see the, the, what, what happened when a part of the world ignored that responsibility. You go to China today. I used to go to China once or twice a year for a number of years. I couldn't believe how bad the smog was in China. So, and, and, and China only recently began to put pollution controls on their automobiles. So you can see what America would have been like by going elsewhere. But that's about the only way you can measure it. What was the greatest achievement of the Clean Air Act? <clears throat> Not to be cute, the Clean Air Act was the greatest achievement itself. Think about this. Before the 1970 Clean Air Act, there was no concept of citizen suits allowing citizens to go into federal courts to enforce mandatory requirements on a federal agency. Simply didn't exist. Unprecedented. Deadlines in the statute. Deadlines not only for achieving uh, auto emission standards, but also for achieving health-based air pollution standards. There, there, to my knowledge, there were no prior statutes that had enforceable deadlines. Three, statutory standards themselves. We wrote into the law that the auto industry had to achieve a 90% reduction in auto emissions. Unheard of in, 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 in federal law. Uh, we, have, we have a judicial review provision which allows citizens to go into court and say, you didn't write the regulations the way the law intended. Unprecedented. We, we, we established a science basis for government policy. Not unprecedented, but unprecedented because that science basis became an enforceable standard which couldn't be overturned based on industry's antagonism to the outcome. Those, those are really critical. And, and, and they became a part of the Clean Water Act. They became a part of Superfund. They became a part of a numerous other pieces of legislation. And they changed the relationship of the Congress to the executive. Because when we wrote the Clean Air Act, we took away the executive's discretionary authority to not do what Congress said they had to do. One of the reasons that the American public so strongly supports the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act is because they think they're still in charge. And that's a huge difference in public policy.